All right, well, welcome. It's good to see y'all here tonight. Bible study, prayer meeting, 9th, 2020, 7 o'clock. And I hope everybody was able to get a prayer list coming in. There are a few updates and a few additions there. And there's um, another another couple updates that I'll I'll mention. But... um, Let's see. Let me go ahead and give you the updates I have. Uh, We'll start near the top there. Uh, Joey McCorkle is, um, we have been talking about, a friend of Cooper's, uh, a recent graduate of Clemson University and uh, working in the agricultural field. And uh, about two weeks ago tomorrow, had a, a terrible... Uh, farming accident with his father and uh, ended up having both his legs removed just above the knee and uh, but Tuesday let's see no Monday Monday he called Cooper and uh, Cooper called me uh, yesterday and uh, to, just to tell me that he was able to speak to him on the phone which means uh, he is no longer in the medically induced coma, and he's got some presence of mind to make phone calls and call his friends. And um, so it was it was a, a great encouragement here, and I could hear in Cooper's voice uh, he was encouraged to hear from him and to be able to just talk to him about anything uh, at all. Because considering how bad the accident was, and then the result of that. Uh, and then the fact that he was put into a coma to try to give his body some some uh, time to heal, and uh, then to get that get that phone call that that's a, a a very big step for him in his recovery, both emotionally and physically. So we're we're really happy about that, and just continue to pray for Joey and uh, for his recovery and for just for his. Um, his positive attitude, especially in the days going forward, because that's uh, that's a big danger, uh, the possibility of really becoming discouraged. And, and it sounds like he's not right now, which is great. And so we want to keep praying for that uh, for him. Uh, then I've got, uh, uh, there's three in a row here. Um, Joshua Sharp. Uh, his apparently has recovered from this heart attack and also the kidney stones have been dealt with so he's doing pretty well so uh, that's a a praise for Joshua and then also Richard Cooper right below that um, he's actually doing well also so um, he's been treated for those uh, issues and uh, is doing well and then right below that Lanny Cooper he actually had um, brain surgery this morning uh, relative to his cancer, and the surgery went very well. Uh, he's in ICU recovering, so just continue to pray for the recovery. But that, uh, that can, his condition is you know, very serious just because of the cancer, but surgery went well today, so just um, continue to pray for recovery there. Um, and then also, um, I was able to go see Willa Mae Anderson this afternoon, and um, she has she has completed the ten days of antibiotics because she was in the, she she's still in the hospital, but she uh, was dealing with pneumonia and then uh, blood infection, bladder infection. So she's finished her antibiotics. And uh, she had a scan yesterday. They haven't gotten the test results back yet, so she's still waiting to hear about that. But just keep praying for her. She's still in the hospital, and they do allow uh, visitors there, uh, but it's just one at a time, and everybody gets uh, temperature and all, and kind of interrogated at the front door. Uh, have you been with any, anybody that's sick, or have you? got any symptoms or anything you know because like anybody gonna tell them they have I mean I don't they, they're just taking your word for it but yeah they got a they put the little temperature scanner on your forehead and all 
Uh, but they are allowing visitors. It's from, from noon to 6 uh, in the afternoon. So, uh, but, so just keep praying for Willa Mae. Keep praying that she'll uh, continue, continue to uh, get better there. Um, let's see. Can I, get, can I get one of y'all to shut that door, please? Thank you. All right, let's see. Don, do you have any, uh, any anything new about Dixie? Really? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Will. I'm sure. So she's doing chemo and radiation. Gracious. Okay. And both of those are five days a week? Yeah, that's going to definitely take a toll on strength. Okay. Um... Well, it's probably is it probably still a little early to tell about the effect if if it's if it's helping. Okay. All right. Um, what about um, I haven't heard anything about Tish. Because she's she's been home on hospice for two weeks. Yeah. Right. Right. That's good. But now she's strong in her faith too. Mm-hmm. And that's a blessing. That is a blessing. Not just for her, but for people around her. Man. Um, also, uh, keep praying for our uh, my brother-in-law, Jason. Uh, he's still making progress. Still slowly but surely in, uh, improving. That's right. Oh, that's right, that's right. Tomorrow... Yeah, that's right. He told me that Thursday. So tomorrow's his appointment to see uh, if they will allow him to start putting any kind of weight on it. And uh, so the the physical therapist so far has been very pleased with the progress. And uh, so yeah, so just keep so pray for that appointment tomorrow, uh, first thing in the morning. And then his therapist, his physical therapist, uh, anticipating good news, has already scheduled him at noon tomorrow to go see her for physical therapy after he's got the other appointment first thing in the morning. So she's expecting it to be good news. So hopefully that will be the case. Uh, also, if you please continue to pray for my good friend Brett, uh, who is in North Carolina. He's still continuing on his leukemia treatments and um, everything, as far as I know, everything is still proceeding in the right direction and uh haven't had any more uh setbacks at all that i that i'm aware of still it's a long it's a long road but he is still progressing down that road so just continue to pray for him and uh i know he will appreciate that and also i should say too uh, today is september the 9th monday is September the 14th that will be his one year wedding anniversary and if you'll recall it was 10 days into his marriage that he got diagnosed and so his entire married life thus far has been pretty much dealing with this so his anniversary their, their anniversary is on Monday so just uh, please if you would remember them especially uh, celebrating a year of marriage and yet uh, it's been a difficult year uh, and they've been, uh, they've really relied on the Lord, and it's been, in many ways, it's been a testimony uh, of faith in God and, and trust in Him uh, in such difficult circumstances. So, uh, just if you would mention, mention Brett and Bonnie in your prayers, I know they would appreciate that. 
Uh, let's see. Also, I should mention, continue to pray for our uh, students, teachers, staff as uh, school has begun. And uh, in that same vein, also, we've got till this Sunday, if you're still considering being involved in our prayer champion ministry, uh, praying for a particular student or teacher or staff member, uh, you still have time to, to get in on that. This Sunday is the deadline for that. Um, okay, I think that's all the updates that I'm uh, aware of. Does anyone have any additions? To the prayer list. Also, everybody back home will be drinking again. I know you're going to drink mine in a couple of minutes. Um, she's doing all right, but they got a problem with her stomach. They can't get her stomach hard to She's got some kind of gas in her stomach. They're trying to figure out what caused it. They had to run another scan on her. I think yesterday. yesterday, yeah. She said they're waiting on, still waiting on the results. Yeah, she mentioned that uh, today. Uh, but hopefully, yeah, well, hopefully she'll get the re results from that scan and then figure out where to go from there. Okay. Okay. See, back in what, the first part of the year, when we were at uh, the Golden Corral at breakfast that morning, he and a couple of other guys were there having Bible study. Okay. And uh, that's the last time I had seen them. But I believe they were here at homecoming. And I think they've been here since when we had the parking, the parking thing out front. Uh, I think they came one time. Okay. Uh, Doing the drive-in? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I don't know. Okay. Nobody, they don't have any children. He's from West Columbia. Okay. She's from Augusta. So but they live in Aiken. They live in Aiken. Okay. So, so we just... But that's what all indications is that he might... And she said she is... They think she has got that in the box. Oh, really? Okay. So we do, do we need to what do we need to do? Do we need to check check uh, obituaries or check try to try to it is? Okay. All right. So we're just waiting in to find out some details and Okay. So possibly then what like today or yesterday? That recent? It was last night earlier this morning. Okay. Okay. Right, that's what John was saying. She is diabetic? Okay. Okay. All right, well, if, you, if any of you find out any details. I have no idea. Karen, is she at home or is she in the hospital? She's home? Okay. Okay. Right, right. Okay. Well, if any, if any of you find out some details, just please pass those along so we can update the prayer list. Uh, 
We'll see. Okay. Uh, any other additions that we need to, to put on here? Who, what was the second name? Michael Lawson. Lawson. Ooh, that's locally? Because I, okay, I went to seminary with a guy named Michael Lawson. It's not the same one, I guess. Really? Was this a, the same, was this the same event? Just separately, both passed away this weekend, this past weekend. Gracious. Okay. All right. Cody Mason and Michael Lawson. We got them. Okay. Anyone else? Any other additions? All right. Well, let's take some time and pray for these, and then we will get into some Bible study. So, Lord, we're here tonight. Um, we are gathered in your name, and we want to begin uh, just by thanking you for loving us the way you do. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you are gracious and merciful. We thank you that you are patient and kind and forgiving. And Lord, we thank you that you're able to meet our needs. Uh, you hear our prayers. You are constantly at work. You're faithful. You're trustworthy. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you are in our lives. We thank you for the privilege we have to come to you in prayer and to spend time in communion with you in this way. And Lord, because of who you are, because of your character, we know we're able to bring all our cares, all our needs, all our requests, our anxiety, uh, every burden we carry, we can bring it to you. And we know you are uh, equipped and able to help and to relieve burdens and to walk with us through struggles because you care for us more than anyone else. So Lord, we thank you for uh, the privilege we have. We thank you for hearing our prayers tonight. We thank you for uh, being among us and hearing our uh, needs and requests that we've already discussed tonight. Uh, we've, we've talked about uh, loss about people who have passed away here in the last several days and the families that are grieving and we pray that you would give encouragement and peace and comfort to the families who have lost loved ones we've talked about people who are uh, struggling with health issues and physical challenges that need a touch from you and we know that you've heard and we know that you're at work so lord we pray that you'd give healing and strength according to your will and according to your plans and purposes. And we know that you're good in all your ways, and even when we can't fully comprehend or even see or understand what you're doing or how things are working out, we know you can be trusted. So, Lord, we lift all these up to you who are in need of, of uh, physical healing and strength. And we pray that you'd continue to be at work in their lives. And, and I pray, Lord, that 
uh, in each of those situations especially that you would uh, make your presence known, that, that your gospel would be uh, revealed in unique ways in those situations where uh, there will be spiritual conversations that Christ might be uh, the center of the conversation and we would be able to, uh, if we're able to be involved in conversations in these, in these situations, Lord, that we'd point people to Jesus as the only hope uh, in life and in eternity. Jesus is our only hope. So, Lord, help us to be good witnesses as we uh, have opportunity uh, to be an encouragement in different people's lives, especially those we're praying for here on this prayer list that we, we've uh, accumulated here. Lord, in all these things, we just, want to, we just want to remind ourselves that you're at work. I pray you'd help us not to fret over troubles, that you'd help us not to uh, worry and be filled with anxiety because we know you, we know who you are, and we know uh, what kind of God you are. And, and like I said, even though it's easy to forget, we know you're at work. And we know you're good, and we know you care for us. And so even when it seems like nothing's happening, uh, you haven't stopped working. And so, Lord, help us to, to increase our faith. Help us to continue to trust you as you hear our prayers and trust you as you're working and know that you're answering in your timing and in your ways. You're working in these circumstances. So Lord, we thank you for that confidence. And I pray you'd keep us mindful of it. Uh, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Uh, especially when things are difficult. And Lord, I also pray your, your, your blessing on our Bible study time tonight. That you'd teach us from your word that you'd give us understanding of your word we know that's the truth and we know it's our standard of truth and it's our uh, only source uh, for guidance in, in in practice in in belief in everything we know that your word uh, is the foundation for us so lord help us to to be able to study well help us to be able to understand and most of all, help us to be obedient so that we can live out what we learn. And Lord, we, we thank you for all these gifts and blessings. We thank you for your presence among us tonight. And we thank you especially for Jesus. And it's in his name I pray all these things. Amen. Well, Sunday, you know, we talked a lot about prayer. And I made a statement uh, Sunday morning that I I believe that I don't pray enough and I encouraged all of you to maybe do your own self-evaluation maybe your own examination of your own life your own habits and because that's an individual thing I can't tell you how much you pray, or if you're praying enough or not enough, I can tell you what I think about me, and I did. I, I don't think I pray enough. Uh, and, and I also said this, if you remember, I said, I don't, I don't know if I'll, if I'll ever get to that point where I say, okay, I'm praying enough. You know, I don't know what that looks like. Because the Bible tells us in the passage we're going to look at in a little bit more detail tonight, Pray without ceasing. So if you turn in your Bibles to Thessalonians chapter 5, I mentioned it on Sunday, and we're going we're gonna to look at it a little more closely tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you get to 1 Timothy, you've gone a little too far. And if you get to Philippians and Colossians, you're almost there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and uh, there's a paragraph uh, beginning in verse 12 that goes through verse 22, and we're going to actually begin, the first two verses talk more about 
uh, the church and the preacher, so to speak. And so we're going to kind of go right below that. We're going to start in verse... Uh, the paragraph begins at verse 12. We're going to start in verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. And, you know, when I mention Scripture references on a Sunday morning, it's because they relate directly to the passage of Scripture we're in. And then Wednesday night, it kind of gives us an opportunity to connect those things a little better and talk a little more about them. Uh, if, you're, if you like to write notes down and jot things down, you can also remember that Sunday morning we did mention Philippians chapter 4 as well, which uh, is a very uh, relevant section of that letter. Philippians 4 from verse 4 to verse 7, talking about praying about everything. Uh, but tonight we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, and we're going to read down to verse 22 and then just talk about that a little bit. And it's bare our habits of prayer. And so very simply, we're going to title this study tonight, Pray All the Time. Pray All the Time. So let's read the scripture here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll start reading in verse 14 if you follow along with me. And Paul is writing this letter uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church that he helped to begin in the city of Thessalonica. So here's what Paul was inspired to write, starting in verse 14, chapter 5. He says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. To that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now this section of this letter, this is the very end of the first letter Paul wrote to this church. Okay, so what he's doing here, just to give you a context of the whole letter... Uh, of 1 Thessalonians, when he gets to, to this portion of the letter, he's kind of giving some closing remarks, okay? He's trying to, trying to summarize and give some, uh, almost some one-liner little uh, bullet point type of instructions uh, to help the church. You know how if you've, if you've talked about a, d a bunch of things in a letter, when you're writing a letter to somebody, and, and then you get to the end, you almost kind of want to just like highlight, all right, let me give you a summary of what we talked about. Here, here's something important. Okay, so he's given them all kinds of uh, in, instructions about, here's, here's the overall theme, Christian conduct. Uh, what's, what's it look like if I'm going to live as a Christian? What are some characteristics that would look like that, okay? And so that's what he's... That's what he's telling them. So let's just kind of walk through, and we'll get to the one that speaks specifically to prayer. But he starts off here in verse 14. He's saying we. Now, if you want to just look back, that's an interesting phrase when, when you know, I said it's Paul. If you look at chapter 1, verse 1, Paul's got a couple brothers with him. One named Silvanus and Timothy. Of course, you know Timothy. Paul... Uh, Timothy uh, got saved under Paul's ministry. He calls him his son in the faith. And so Timothy, he wrote two letters, ironically, right after Thessalonians in our Bible, to Timothy. Those were the last letters he wrote before he died. And so Timothy's with him when he's writing this. So it's Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. So when he says here, we, that's who he's talking about. Okay, he's got, got a couple of brothers with him. But he says, we urge you, brethren... So here's what you see, first of all, there's a relationship. That he wants to draw on the fact that we're all in the same family, we're all on the same team. 
he's almost including himself and Sylvanus and Timothy in this admonition to say, we, we're all needing to do this, okay? Just, I, I said it Sunday, I think the Sunday before too. I'm not preaching at you because I need this message just as bad as anybody in the room. I need the encouragement. I need the reminder just like everybody else. So uh, I'm just, I just happen to be the one who's relaying the message. But Paul says the same thing. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. So what's that mean? What's that mean? Admonish. It's, it's admonish is kind of an encouragement. It's kind of a, um, uh, an, it's, it's almost an instruction, but it's a, I, I wanted to use the word encouragement, but he uses that right, right after that. But it's more of a, it's, it's stronger than an encouragement, but it's not like a hard and fast command. It's just, this would be good for you to do, kind of like that. Admonish the unruly. So almost like a, a it's like an encouragement with a hint of correction. Maybe that's a good way to, to put it. So he's telling the church, brethren, the church, brothers and sisters, in the family of God, admonish the unruly. So you got some, you know what unruly means. You got some folks that are, that are a little bit wild, maybe a little bit prone to go off the path a little bit. Nudge them back, right? Nudge them, bring them back to the path, okay? Admonish the unruly. If you have somebody that's unruly in the church or uh, closely associated with that family, admonish them, correct them, gently nudge them back to the right path. Admonish them. Then encourage the faint-hearted. You know what faint-hearted means? Talk about our prayer list. You think about all those situations where someone could easily be discouraged or faint-hearted. So what do they need? They need encouragement. They need their spirits lifted. So you see how this is a lot of general teaching that's for the good of the body. Admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Doesn't say help the strong. Help those who need help, who are physically or emotionally weak. Help the weak. That's a pretty straightforward. I don't, I don't have to spend a lot of time on that one. Help the weak, right? But then look at the last part of verse 14. Be patient with everyone. Patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Be patient with everyone. So this is the challenge. If you've got a group of people who are unruly and some are faint-hearted and some are weak, you need to admonish some, you need to encourage some, you need to help some, but everybody requires patience. Uh, I saw a video, a short little, like a 10 second video on, uh, on, the, uh, on some social media this morning that made me laugh really hard. And it was a little child, uh, I don't know, like two years old maybe, and sitting there with a cup, looked like, uh, you know, like if you see like an insulated coffee cup, but it's like hard cardboard, you know, is that kind of material, and it's had a, got the plastic lid on it, it's got one little hole in it for a straw, and apparently somebody had given this child a cup and a straw, and this child was trying to put the straw into the straw hole, and uh, they, they were sitting there, you know, sitting on the floor, had the cup right there between their legs, sitting there, and, and it, the caption said, my level of patience. And then and the video started, and the, the child takes the straw and literally tried maybe once or twice, just like, and then, and then just threw it. Just like, I've had enough of this. I can't get, can't get the straw in the straw hole, and just, they were done with it. They, didn't, they had zero patience, right? So that's an example of how not to be when it comes to ministry in the church. Uh, patient with everyone, and, and, and quite honestly... When we're trying to admonish somebody who's unruly or encourage somebody who's faint-hearted or help somebody who's weak, you've got to have patience. And, and you know what I struggle with? Patience. And I'm probably not the only one. That's, that's the reason why you don't ever pray for patience. Because as soon as you do, you are going to be blessed with multiple opportunities to practice patience. 
right? As soon as you pray for it, that's what's going to happen. So be careful. But it's, it's, it's a required characteristic. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Admonish the unruly, un- encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Now verse 15 is especially applicable to our current cultural climate. See to it. Now, this, now understand, what's the context? Who's the audience? It's the church. Okay? So when we go through this, I want us to always remember the context because it is super important that the church set the example. That, so understand, this is not Paul talking to the whole world. It's Paul talking to the church. Just remember that because if, if he was, you know, try to say some of this to the whole world, you know, they're going to cuss you or laugh at you or, you know, ignore you. This is instruction to the church. The church should be setting the example. He says, see that no one repays another with evil for evil. Now, isn't that, that's kind of a, an offshoot of the golden rule, right? Do to others as you would have them do to you. Not the popular rebranding of that which says do to others before they do to you, right? That's, that's not how it goes. It, it, and it's not, it's not contingent on what they do to you. It's do to others as you would have them do to you, regardless of how they actually act. Do to them how you would have them do to you. And so don't repay someone evil for evil. In other words, don't respond in kind. Someone does you wrong, don't, we, we have a, and, and honestly, this is, the, this is the battle, the internal struggle of the flesh versus the spirit. Because the flesh says, oh, I'm going to get you for that, right? I'm going to get you back, and I'm going to do you one better. So you did me this way, I'm going I'm to take it up a notch when I get you back. It's going to be worse for you. That's the natural, natural response. It's not the godly biblical response, but it's the natural response. So we're supposed to not repay evil for evil, but the contrast there, you see, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. So you see how that's broken down into two categories? You have, this is how we're going to treat people in the church, right, who are in the spiritual family, but this is also how we're going to treat everybody. So it's no exception, and this is why I said the church should be setting the example, because when we treat people in the church like this, I mean, that's, that should be normal, right? Right? We, we, all, we all should know that. We should all know better, right? So this should be overkill within the church context, because I'm of the firm belief a disagreement with anybody in my spiritual family, I should be able to sit down face to face with that person and have a calm, polite, honorable conversation and work it out. If we can't come to a, an agreement at the end, that's okay. But, but here's what, here's what is, is not going to happen. I'm not going to, I don't have the, the right to be unkind or rude or impolite or any we even if we don't agree i'm i'm still bound to love you that's that's how it's got to be in the church between two christian people we got to love each other it doesn't it doesn't mean everybody's going to agree about everything because that's just silly i mean nobody nobody's going to agree about everything Right? But even, even if we don't agree, we, we're supposed to love each other. Isn't that what John 13, 35 said? Jesus said, the world will know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. That, that's the, the litmus test for a follower of Jesus, right? So it doesn't matter if we disagree. I'm not supposed to be unkind. I'm supposed to love you even if we don't see eye to eye on an issue, right? 
It's how we, how we handle the issue is important. Now, that's within the church. But see, the Bible says I'm not supposed to repay somebody evil for evil outside the church either. And you want to talk about what should confuse somebody is somebody who doesn't know Jesus, doesn't read the Bible, doesn't go to church, and they do you wrong, and you respond in a way completely different than what they would expect you to do. That ought to make some people go, what in the world is wrong with that person? They ought to be confused, right? Because what are they expecting you to fight, probably? Because that's what the world does, right? That's not what the Christian does. So that second part, for good for one another and for all people, that's very important. That sets the church apart from the world. And it demonstrates our uh, standing in the family of God. Verse 16, 17, and 18 kind of go together as one sentence. It's broken up by semicolons. It's kind of a continual thought. But it's a threefold admonition. It says, rejoice always. In everything, give thanks. So there's three things to do, three imperative commands. Rejoice always. Does that mean everything's going to be good always? <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. But what's the difference? Remember, he's writing to the church. What's the difference for the Christian? I've got to rejoice in the Lord. Not in my circumstance. I've got to rejoice in the Lord despite my circumstance many times you know things may be bad this may not have gone like i wanted it to uh i may not see a way out of this difficult situation i don't know what's going to happen but you know what the joy of the lord is my strength not my circumstance i'm not going to be blinded by like peter was when he got out of the boat and he started to sink he took his eyes off of jesus and he looked at the waves and his mind said this can't be happening and he started to go down in the water. And Jesus, you, why did you doubt me? Jesus is the one told him to get out on the water, right? So our eyes have to stay focused on Christ, not our circumstance. That's how we're able to do verse 16. We're able to rejoice always because we're not rejoicing at our circumstance. We're rejoicing at our Savior. Pray without ceasing. Now, does this mean when you're asleep? Does it mean when you're riding down the highway, you're supposed to be looking at the road? You're supposed to be using your turn signal? Use your turn signal. It's a little free public service announcement. Use your turn signal. I saw a bump, uh, not a bumper sticker, it was a window sticker. It said... Uh, God moves in mysterious ways, but you don't have to. Use your turn signal. I thought that was very appropriate. But the point is, we're not going to ride down the highway, close our eyes, and start praying, right? We're going to watch the road. We're going to try to pay attention. But it's an attitude of prayer. It's a mindset of prayer. It's a constant communion with God. It's uh, uh, Pray without ceasing is more of a, uh, a command that says... Uh, regardless of where I am, regardless of what I'm doing, regardless of who I'm with, regardless of what's before me, I need to be in touch with Jesus. I, I need to have a, um, a, a, a community, a, a, a conversation, so to speak. Uh, I need to have the, the pipeline of communication open with Jesus at all times. Pray without ceasing. And then verse 18 says, in everything give thanks. Again, this is just like the verse 16, rejoice always. Are you going to give thanks for all the bad things that happened? Well, maybe not. But are you going to give thanks uh, that Jesus is walking with you through them? Of course. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. And why does Paul say to do that? It's the will of God. Those three things for the Christian in Christ Jesus, that's the will of God. You know, you know how many times the, a Christian will say, well, I just can't figure out God's will for my life. I just can't figure out what God wants me to do. I don't know, should I go to 
this school or that school? Should I take this job or that job? Or should I uh, live in this town or in this town? Or this state or this state? Or should I, you know, what should I do? What am I supposed to do? What does God want me to do? Well, that's a, a, another sermon. And that's more specific. But in general, how do we find out God's will? It's all right here. You want to know what God's will is for your life as a follower of Christ? It's in the Word. And there, there's three things right there that's clear as day because He tells you. Right? <laughs> Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's, that's the clearest uh, description of God's will we can ever find when He says this is God's will. Okay? So we know in general terms... That's God's will for every believer, is to rejoice, pray, give thanks. Things that ought to be characteristic of a Christian life. Now, verse 19 and verse 20 go together, and it's a contrast with verse 21 and 22. So these last four verses kind of comprise the last little section here. Do not quench the Spirit. What does it mean to quench the Spirit? How do you understand that? Quench the Spirit. What's that? Don't stop it. Don't stop it. Okay, that's good. Do not quench the Spirit. You know, uh, some denominational traditions take, it, take the Holy Spirit and kind of go too far with what the Holy Spirit does biblically. And you know, some denominational traditions are afraid of the Holy Spirit doing anything and don't, don't want Him to go far enough. And so I believe that according to Scripture, we've got to find, we gotta find the, the scriptural middle ground and not be afraid but, you know, and not... not uh, attribute things to the Spirit that may be unbiblical, but I, th I believe the Bible clearly teaches we are to walk in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8. Walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I mean, it's a, 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 a plain contrast between uh, walking in the flesh, walking in the Spirit. We should be Spirit-filled. Ephesians 5 says be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so... There's clear instruction that the Holy Spirit should be guiding the Christian. And so Paul says here, don't stop that from happening. What, do we, what does every Christian have inside them, figuratively speaking, uh, guy, as, as, a, as an indwelling guide? It's the Holy Spirit. It's a deposit. It's the guarantee of our inheritance. So we have to yield ourselves, and this is really what we're talking about here, yield ourselves to the leading and the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why when Jesus ascended, he said, I'm going to send the helper, the advocate. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. It's, and that's why he kept saying, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if he doesn't ascend, the Holy Spirit won't come. And be with us, in us, and, and through us. So we can't then, since that's God's design, to indwell His followers such that the, the people of God will then be led and instructed and guided by the Spirit. We can't then try to quench that. Because that would be completely opposite of what God's designed for, uh, for us to do. So do not quench the Spirit. Exactly, exactly. Use your gifts. God gives us spiritual gifts, and, and we can only use them with the power given by the Holy Spirit, right? Isn't that what Jesus said at Pentecost? Uh, before Pentecost? When? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you'll be my witnesses. So the Holy Spirit is vital to our uh, existence and our uh, success as a follower of Christ. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Now, look, look at this, the connection between verse 20 and 21. 
do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. So, you take, uh, when you see prophetic utterances, you have Scripture, but then w- when someone, anyone, wants to say something, hey, well, God told me this. Really? Show it to me in here. That's always my answer. Because I'm going to tell you what, and, and this is a truth that will always be a truth forevermore. The Bible says, that, that phrase, the Bible says, is always greater than God told me. Now I'm going to let that sink in for a second. Before everybody, well not everybody, I mean, do y'all understand what I'm saying? If I say, well, God told me such a... Is that, is that more authoritative than the Bible says? You see what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? If, 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 if I have... If, listen, what would happen if I stood up here and I, I was going to teach you and, and preach to you and I said, well... How about this? What if I did this? You know, let me just tell you what God told me. And I put the Bible down. What have I just communicated to you? It's my, it's my thought. It's my opinion. It's my authority. I don't, I don't, have, an, I don't have any authority. I've said that before, and I hope everybody understands that. I have no authority here. God has the authority, not me. So that, that's why you should always see me standing up here. The Bible says this, not... The preacher says, or God told me, because let me, let me tell you why I'm saying that. And why this is so important. And why Paul makes a deal about it here at the end. God may very well have told me something. But you know how that's confirmed? You compare it to what the Bible says. See, the Bible is always the final authority. It's not what I say, not what I think. That, that is not the authority. It's what God has said. Because this is, this is indisputable right here. I can tell you, I mean, I can, not that I would. Not that I would. But I could tell you that God told me whatever I wanted to tell you, he told me. It doesn't mean it's true. But I could, just, I could just come up with something. Hey, well, you know, God told me such and such, so y'all better, you know, that's not how it works. If I can't point to a book, a chapter, and a verse in this word and say, look, this is what God... Am I making sense? Okay. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. And then look what Paul says here at the end. Hold fast... To that which is good, translation, hold fast to what God abstain from every form or every appearance of evil. That's how Paul has uh, been inspired to instruct the church as a closing statement in his uh, first letter here to the church. And, and what's uh, unique about the center paragraph? Because we, we've gone through here, uh, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, don't repay evil for evil, always seek that which is good for one another and for all people. And then you skip down to the verse 19, don't quench the spirit, don't despise prophecy, but examine everything, hold fast to the good, abstain from the evil. But in the middle of all that, all those commands, in the very middle, What's, what's he say in the middle that this is the will of God for you? Rejoice, pray, 
give thanks. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. And listen, listen to, to the absolute terms. When do we rejoice? Always. When do we pray? We never stop. In what circumstances do we give thanks? Everything. Those are absolute statements. That's God's will. In Christ, that is God's will for His people. Rejoice always. Never stop praying. Attitude of prayer. In every situation, in every... Give thanks to God. Even... See, the reason why those three things are put together in the middle and those three things are said to be the will of God in Christ Jesus for us because they're constant regardless of our circumstance. Even in difficult times, because of Christ, we can rejoice. Even in our worst circumstance, because of Christ, we have many reasons to be thankful. E e even in, every, in, in any physical, earthly situation, there's no situation where we're praying. I'll close with Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. You see those two contrasts? Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Present your request to God and the peace of Jesus. Prayer is the ingredient in all that. Pray all the time. Now you know why I say I don't pray enough. All the time. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for letting us be together. Uh, thank you for the privilege of sharing our needs and burdens and presenting them to you in prayer. And thank you for hearing us. Thank you for giving us uh, faith and confidence in you. And Lord, I pray that this week, as we go from here, you would remind us no need to worry in any circumstance, but we can pray in every circumstance. We should rejoice all the time. We should pray all the time. We should give thanks all the time because of Christ. So help us to remember that uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.